Today's story is one of the most claustrophobic I have ever told. Brent Colvin had been exploring Thunder Canyon Cave in McCain Valley about 70 miles east of San Diego, California with six fellow members of a cavers club Sunday afternoon when things went very wrong. Fellow caving enthusiast Jim Ness climbed into the cave and stood upright next to Brent, trying to keep him calm and reassure him. Neither man was sure there would be a good outcome, though they didn't say that out loud. Inside, Brent was terrified and didn't want to die this way. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Brent Colvin and a group of seven cavers, Luca Carabini, the leader and guide, Heather, Steve, who is 50, Jim Ness, who is 60, Ben, and Brian set out to do a through trip through Thunder Canyon Cave. A through trip means they are entering a cave's entrance and leaving through a different exit location. The cave is off the grid and hard to find. You can't find directions to it and must learn about the place from a caver who is open to telling you about how to get there. Thunder Canyon Cave is in eastern San Diego County. After a few miles on a dirt road, one must hike another two miles on a trail to reach the cave. At the trail's end, there is a fair amount of scrambling to get to the various entrances. The cave typically has a bit of water flowing through it, but with recent rains at the time, there was a significant flow of water. The experienced cavers had made this particular trip before. The cave is an adrenaline rush unlike any other cave because of this mythic reputation and the type of stories you only hear about very rarely. The group wanted to spend more time enjoying the challenges of the cave and each other's company on this particular trip. This cave is particularly claustrophobic with many tight spaces and it is pitch black if you don't have flashlights with you. The cave requires the use of ropes to repel and there are many heavy metal chains that help you get through the tough sections of the cave. Many opportunities in this cave will cause you to get stuck or severely injured if you happen to fall into them. You must pay close attention the entire time exploring this cave due to all of the hazards. Inside of the cave, it is actually quite unsettling due to the random nature of the boulders that you must get past. The cave is called a talus cave, made up of piles of large boulders carved out over time by streams running right through them. It kind of looks like the movie set of a horror film, and most people should never enter this cave due to the difficulty of making it out safe. Making your way through this cave is slippery, sharp, with massive drop-offs that give little to no notice. Brent Colvin is a 39-year-old software engineer from Valley Center, California. He is meticulous in planning his cave excursions, a trait that he actually learned from his demanding software engineer career. Brent had a wife, Raina, who he got married to beneath a 500-year-old oak tree in their backyard. He loves her dearly, and she is his biggest supporter in everything he does, including caving. The 215 pound caver has been exploring caves like Thunder Canyon Cave for about a year. He is considered an advanced caver and takes his time working through caves to make sure he is safe. Brent was excited to meet up with his fellow cavers and take another crack at Thunder Canyon Cave. On Sunday, May 3rd, 2010, the group hiked for a couple hours through the desert to reach the cave. They got to the cave site at 11 a.m., found the entrance, and set up their gear and put on their wetsuits. Then they had to descend a rock face using a double rope coiled around their body fixed to a boulder near the cave's opening. They planned on going downstream, then taking a break at the middle of the entrance to choose which section of the cave they wanted to explore next. However, this rappel was dangerous because they had to rappel 45 feet or 13 meters down into the darkness and through a waterfall into a pool that was very cold. Getting down the rope safely was quite a rush for Brent, but this is part of the excitement he was looking forward to all month while he was planning this trip out. Once down, there was a sense of relief from most of the group and terror for the others. Luca the guide was happy that everyone made it into the cave safe. This was the first major hurdle and it was now completed. Steve, who was the second to go down, got soaked and then had to wait. He began shaking and acting a bit erratically. Reality began to set in at this time regarding how hard the cave trip would be, and Luca asked the group if anyone wanted to turn back and leave. They all decided to continue to the middle entrance. 
It took about 10 to 15 minutes to set up the next 80 foot rappel and also at this point the cave was starting to get a lot colder. The group continued down the cave, crawling, climbing, wading through icy water, and a bit of shimmying. They had to make two more rappels along the way, but luckily these actually went very smooth and there was no incidents. At this point they reached a fissure, known as the Terrible Traverse, at around 3pm. It got this name because it takes a right angle into a 9 inch wide granite crack, traversed sideways, and so tight you cannot turn your head. Someone placed a wood board to prevent other cavers from sliding further down into the gap and becoming stuck. The crack goes vertical 200 feet or 60 meters and less than 5 minutes from the downstream end of the cave where if you get through you are now at the exit of the cave. This was the group's goal today and they were actually very excited at this point because they were really close to the end. Having caved for hours over boulders and carefully navigated tight crevices, Brent was exhausted, wet, and sore. Yet despite all of this, he was exhilarated as he had never made it to this point in the cave before. It was a personal mission to make it through this part of the cave, which was very rare for most cavers, but Brent wanted to prove to himself and his colleagues that he had reached that next level as an expert caver. The group removed and packed their harnesses. Luca went through the crack first to assist from the other side. Steve was feeling very cold and tired, so he decided to go next. He tried to rush through the crack and got stuck. He was already in bad shape and now he was really starting to freak out. This was his worst nightmare, he hasn't been caving that much, he was the one on the trip with the least amount of experience. After 10 minutes of pulling and pushing, they were able to yank him out and he was free. Steve was exhausted and traumatized from this situation, and he had never been pinned like that between two boulders before. He then realized, experience-wise, he was in way over his head and needed to leave the cave immediately. While Steve was freaking out, three more cavers got through the crack with no issues. The guy Luca then escorted the other three members of the group to the exit of the cave. Luca assumed that Brent and Jim could handle themselves until he returned, because they were expert cavers. Brent was second from last to go through the same aperture that Steve just got stuck in. Brent had never attempted to get through a gap this tight before, and his heart was beginning to beat faster and faster just thinking about trying this. He didn't realize that Luca wasn't there. If he had known, he would not have attempted this fissure as he needed Luca to help guide him through. The challenge of getting through is that you have to move your feet first down the length of the crack, then angle your body sideways to shimmy along before dropping 5 feet to the floor of the next chamber. On Brent's first attempt, intuition told him that he would not make it through, but Jim encouraged him to try anyway. However, he didn't want to inconvenience anyone by having to make the long trip back through the cave, so he backed out and took off his wetsuit before attempting to get through. In just his t-shirt, he tried to slide through again, but his hips jammed. His feet were poking through the other side, and his left arm was the only thing supporting his body. His hand rested on a wooden plank that had been left covering boulders to protect cavers from slipping through deep into the crack. Brent could feel the tension of the rock pressing up against his body as he tried to push through. His chest was squeezed in and his body was contorted. He wiggled and strained for a bit before realizing he couldn't move backward, forward, up or down. His face was pressed hard against the cold rock wall and he realized he was completely stuck. Suddenly, sweat began to pour down his face and he wanted to cry. He knew that this was one of the worst possible things that could have happened in the cave. Luca finally returned and heard Brent moaning in between the rock walls. He quickly jumped into action as adrenaline shot through his body. Luca and Jim tried everything. Brent was stuck very bad. After about two hours, Brent started to lose the feeling in his arms and his positioning in between the two rock walls. He slid further into the crack, where the gap was only eight and a half inches wide. His body weight was now on his left elbow, his back and chest touching the cold granite walls. The guy behind him, Jim, tried unsuccessfully to yank at Brett, but it was really painful how hard he was pulling, and it was not working. But unfortunately, if Brett didn't get out, Jim wasn't getting out either, and they would both die. With the risk of hypothermia, the group shielded Brent with jackets and anything they could find. 
They told Brent that he needed to keep moving any part that he could, even if it was just a slight amount, so he started kicking out his right leg. Apart from Jim's headlamp, they were in total darkness. As Brent drifted in and out of a dreamlike state, Jim told stories to keep him awake. He had been trapped for five hours at this point, and he no longer expected to make it out alive. But Brent wasn't prepared to give up just yet because he thought about his wife Raina and how much he loved her and wanted to see her again. When Luca and Jim couldn't get him out, Luca ran for help. He climbed out, hiked two miles to a car, drove to the top of a hill, and called 911. Unfortunately, instead of calling for rescue, he called for a medical team by mistake. Eventually, Sheriff Sergeant Don Parker, the search and rescue team coordinator, was notified at about 6.40 p.m., and two other specialized teams from the department were mobilized. Other responders from the San Diego Fire Rescue Department and the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department, the Border Patrol, and the Bureau of Land Management. Ben and Brian heard all the commotion, and they wanted to help. They entered the cave and covered Brent with their wetsuits for warmth. The highly trained Borstar paramedics immediately understood what they were up against and demanded more rescuers. Only then did the command post better understand the desperate situation in the cave. Being stuck can kill the caver through hypothermia, restricted breathing, and other complications. It's usually not much of a problem for experienced cavers. Most of them have been stuck in a tight passage and learned that a calm head and careful movement can usually remedy the situation. Sometimes, however, extracting a stuck caver from a tight passage or aperture can be extremely difficult and they do die occasionally. After seven hours, Lucas spotted the rescue helicopter. The rough terrain made finding the cave and landing the helicopter very challenging. It took another four hours to locate the cave and find a suitable landing spot. The medical team worried that Brent would get compartment syndrome if his chest started to swell, pushing against his heart and possibly leading to cardiac arrest. With a dim view of Brent and Jim's survival, the medical staff called again to the rescue team and let them know they need to get there ASAP. It's been nine hours in and Brent is starting to have delirious visions and he's not making any sense. While on the way over, the rescue team developed a plan with the resources that they knew were available. Knowing the cave, they asked if there was any ATVs or a helicopter that they would have access to, to be able to get over to the cave. They carried a lot of gear, water, food, ropes, and an assortment of other extraction equipment. These particular rescuers were experts and they had all been there before. They had good coordinates to get into the cave, but this is the Boulder Talus Cave, so it's not easy to find in daylight because there's boulders everywhere that look very similar. As more cave rescue arrived, there was a flurry of activity around the cave site. They made a challenging trek down a steep, rocky hill with no trails to the cave entrance. It took them an hour or so to reach the cave. Once they arrived, they made their way over to Brent to assess him. The cave rescuers immediately began to explain the situation and danger of hypothermia to Brent and everyone else trying to rescue him. People don't often understand the extreme risk of hypothermia in cases like this. Brent is stuck in a crack that is the length of his body and about 9 inches wide. Most of his body is now in contact with rock many degrees below his body temperature and he cannot move to assist in warming his body. Although you can survive at night in 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius temperatures, you cannot survive that long when you are wedged between two 70 degree rocks. You will eventually reach a temperature of 70 degrees. You will be dead long before that happens. The first order of business was to warm Brent as much as possible. He has been stuck for about 10 hours and needs as much warmth and comfort that they can provide. They placed heat packs around his body and gave him a bit of an electrolyte drink. Both Jim and Brent were hypothermic and they needed to get out of this cave as soon as possible. The rescuers then jacked up the plank near Brett's head to angle him so he could exit the crack. As they began to yank his feet, he wails painfully while compressed in this tight space. When they asked him if they should stop, he shouted out, Keep going! I do not care if you break my ribs, just get me out! The main rescuers that were trying to grab Brent out at this time were John Norman, Paul Stavell, Mark Bender, Mark Kinsey, and Robert Hill. The crew on the lower side rigged a few anchors high in the crack and attached ropes to the board alongside Brent. 
The thought was that they could raise the boards and Brent at the same time. Initial attempts to move the board out of the way did not work, so the team added a bit of mechanical advantage. At about this time, they determined a carjack may be helpful as well as a 6 to 8 foot 2 meter piece of lumber. Once the jack was in the cave, they started using it, but it was just not working. So the team gave another pull on the mechanical advantage system and successfully moved Brent three inches. At which point, John Norman began yanking Brent as hard as he could. This got the ball rolling. Brent was screaming at this point, but they decided to keep pulling on Brent's legs. It looked like he was starting to come out. The crew moved all the blankets around him and pulled like crazy, and eventually, they yanked him out. He didn't really know what was going on at first, but then Brent was profoundly joyous with freedom. They gave him some more electrolyte drinks, and then he rested for about 20 minutes, and then eventually climbed out of the cave. It was 3.45 a.m. when he was winched out of the hillside by a helicopter to meet an ambulance. He had a few scrapes and bruises on him, but overall, he was feeling good and so happy to be out. Brent said he isn't giving up on cave exploration, but he's not going to go through a tight squeeze situation anytime soon. Right about the time Brent was freed, Jim made his way through the squeeze as well. In all, a total of 10 members of the cave team were on hand for the rescue. In addition, two members of Borstar assisted the team with the cave-in duties, and a San Diego Sheriff's SAR member assisted with communications at the cave entrance. I just want to say thanks for watching the video, and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content. As always, I would really appreciate it if you'd be nice to the like button, and I have many other disaster videos on my channel that you might want to check out. See you at the next one.